Uh, I'm Greg Gershuni. Uh, I'm the executive director for the Energy and Environment Program at the Aspen Institute. I'm also the director of Aspen Ideas Climate, so thank you all for being here. Um, thanks, thank you. Um, so we, as the Aspen Institute, has been working on energy policy uh, for more than 50 years. Uh, our program started as uh, in response to the oil embargo of the 70s and how to build efficiency and sustainability into our energy system. And today we do work on US energy policy, we do work on deploying new technologies, we do work on global energy and geopolitics, and um, you know that's kind of the core of what we do in addition to all the other things. And so today we're talking about electrifying equitably. And so we've heard throughout the week that one of the many solutions to solving climate change and to reaching net zero is about electrifying everything and making sure that the grid is as clean as possible, that we get to zero emissions from the grid. And so today we're gonna to talk about how we do that, but how we do that by making sure that everyone is included in that electrification, that everyone benefits from the electrification and that people aren't left behind as we're doing that. And so I've got four great panelists today and I'm gonna let them each introduce themselves and talk about some of the work that they're doing and then we're gonna dive deep into ways that we can electrify equitably. And I'm gonna start kind of zoomed in and then we're gonna zoom out because I, uh, I love Zoom. Uh, but since we're here in person, Carla, why don't you tell us about you and your work? Sure, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be a panelist here. I'm Carla Walker Miller. I'm the founder and CEO of Walker Miller Energy Services. We're a 24 year old company and we've morphed into what I call, we are catalyzers of equity in the clean energy economy. So my company has one mission and I have an assignment. My company's mission again is to, um, is to really change lives through clean energy. And I do that by inviting black and brown people and anyone else who feels disconnected from the clean energy economy into the economy. In my day job, we are what is called implementation contractors for utilities, which means we design, uh, manage, and implement programs that help them help their customers use less energy, thereby relieving or at least decreasing the energy burden, burden on their existing customers. And we also help them install and train people to actually um, use lower energy saving devices and adopt energy, clean energy behaviors. Uh, for example, uh, the largest contract we have right now is at Commonwealth Edison, the Chicago Electric Utility. And they have an $80 million contract that's aimed in helping low to moderate income, R3, which uh, is an Illinois policy term, restore, renew, reinvest communities. And those are communities that are affected by high incarceration rates, uh, by drugs, and by disinvestment, long-term disinvestment, and low to moder moderate income and EJ communities. The interesting th thing, though, is that we're working with them on beneficial electrification. 50 to 70% of those funds have to be spent on those communities, including EV charging stations and preparing them for electric vehicles. Um, the most interesting part of that to me is number one, um, most people say poor people don't need EVs, can't afford EVs, don't care about EVs. Part of equity is they have every right to understand, to have opportunities and have construct, policy-driven constructs to allow them to afford those. So the hardest thing for us is going to be convincing them that they have a right and an interest, not just to have jobs, not to drive, just drive cars, to pro provide thought leadership in the EV space and every other space to expand and create new businesses in those spaces. Uh, part of, so that's my job, my assignment again. And uh, the difference between a mission and an assignment is you can abort a mission an assignment, you know, an assignment is an assignment and it is mine. And I am so determined to make sure everyone 
has space and finds their place in clean energy. Because if they don't, we fail. If everyone doesn't have a place and if we don't have a roadmap to help people find their place, we fail. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. And you know, one interesting um, piece of data I saw a couple weeks ago uh, EIA put out was the average electric vehicle is now only just a little bit more expensive than the average um, gasoline vehicle. And so it's starting to come out. It's not nearly um, uh, cheap enough for everybody, but it is moving in the right direction. Can I just say one more yeah. thing? Used electric vehicles yes. is one of the tactics yeah. that we're using with these communities because they're communities who never buy a new car. Yeah. So. So um, going from kind of the local and community aspect to the state perspective, Steve um, did not get the red and pink memo, but that's okay. Um, Steve, introduce yourself and tell, you what, tell us what you do in the state of California. Well, thanks, Greg, and that's very hard to follow, Carla. Um, really appreciate your remarks there. Um, and I'm really glad to be here. It's been a fantastic conference. and. Um, uh, despite some of the table dancing I saw last night, I have great respect <laughs> for you, Greg. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so I am Steve Cliff. I am the executive officer of the California Air Resources Board. CARB, as it's commonly known, is the state's clean air and climate agency. And it's a little bit unique because we predated the US EPA, and as a result, in the Federal Clean Air Act, CARB has, delegated to CARB, California has special authority where we can establish regulations that are more stringent than those in the federal government. So CARB typically has worked really hard to establish those regulations for a variety of equipment on and off road, including everything from leaf blowers to weed whackers to cars and trucks and tractors. We also have a, a huge incentives portfolio. We're about a $2.8 billion budget, most of which goes through for incentives. And uh, have about 2,000 staff that are working on these various regulations and incentive programs to get money out to Californians to move towards zero emissions. So we have a goal in California, which is actually in state law, that we must achieve carbon neutrality no later than 2045. So carbon neutrality means sources equal sinks. It also states that we have to reduce by at least 85% the combustion of petroleum <clears throat> fossil fuels. So we have a really aggressive target that's in law, gives CARB and other agencies a lot of authority to put together programs to achieve those goals. Importantly, it's not just about achieving those goals for for everyone in the state, but there is a focus, especially in the incentive programs, for that money going to what we call priority populations. Those are identified in a variety of state laws, either as a disadvantaged community or a low-income community or a combination thereof. But effectively, for the purposes of this conversation, these are environmental justice communities, um, black and brown communities, who need to receive most of the benefits of these programs first because if those communities are getting those benefits first, that's gonna benefit everybody in the state because we know we can do it right. Um, and just to give you an example of that, we have what's called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. This is money that comes from the auction of carbon allowances under the state's cap and trade program. To date, a little over $27 billion has been allocated for reducing greenhouse gas emissions for a, a whole host of programs. And of the money that's been spent, about 74% of that has gone to benefit those priority populations. So we're really proud of the work that we're doing in California. We have a lot more to do. We have a plan for how we're going to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, it's a very credible plan with modeling. It shows the job benefits, it shows the health benefits, it shows the the um, greenhouse gas em emission reduction benefits and lays out kind of this broad approach for how we're gonna achieve these, uh, these uh, carbon neutrality objectives. The last thing that I'll say is 
we're not just looking at climate. We're actually looking at solutions that also help us reduce toxic and criteria air pollution. And that means that solutions that still rely on combustion long term aren't really going to be sufficient because we need to reduce criteria pollution and toxic air pollution as well. And uh, so combustion is not going to be the future. So we really have a zero emissions first type approach for how we look at all of our regulations. And then if not achievable or if that's far off, then we kind of develop the glide path for how we're going to get to those zero emission uh, goals. Um, that solves all of our problems at once. California, the most populous state in the nation, also has some of the worst air quality problems in the nation, where 90% of Californians actually breathe poor air as defined by US EPA every day. So our air is getting a lot better. We've done fantastic things with all of our work, but we have a lot more to do. And by, by focusing on both climate and air quality simultaneously, we know that we've got the right long-term objectives and programs in place to achieve both of those goals and doing so in a way that brings especially those who have been most overburdened by pollution along and getting the benefits to them first. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. And, you know, it's it's pretty amazing to see um, the Air Resources Board and just how long um, CARB's been fighting this fight uh, and leading the way across the country. Um, so if you have thought about electrifying your home and you've gone onto Google and you're like, how do I electrify my home? Odds are you ended up um, on Ari's website. And so Ari, can you talk about your work with Rewiring America and um, what you're doing and who you are? Thanks, Greg. Um, I didn't see any table dancing, but I also wasn't there. <clears throat> um, <laughs> So uh, it's really wonderful to be here with all of you and to be on this panel. Greg, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so just to scene set a little bit uh, when it comes to why electrifying is so important, um, we think about it at Rewiring America as electrifying everything in the economy that can be electrified as the most clear, direct path to addressing our climate crisis. And the reason for that is because um, almost 90% of our emissions come from energy generation to consumption. And the thing that people know less of is that 42% of those energy-related emissions are tied to kitchen table decisions. What kind of cars people drive, how they heat the air and water in their homes, how they cook their food, dry their clothes, and where the power comes for those things. And that creates a but-for in our climate strategy. Unless we deal with those climate uh, kitchen table decisions, there's no way for us to come anywhere near our climate goals. Um, and if you just keep unpacking that, that's a very, it starts leading down a path that is um, both uh, sobering and empowering at the same time. Sobering because those kitchen table decisions across 124 million households in the United States equate to a billion machines that need to be installed or replaced as electric over the next couple of decades. Um, several hundred million consumer decisions that people are making. Um, that's pretty sobering. Um, but there is something very empowering about that because the path to electrifying those machines also unlocks on average $3,000 a year in energy bill savings, um, much better indoor air quality and better health benefits, jobs that can't be automated offshore or um, uh, delegated to chat GPT. Um, and uh, really the largest wealth transfer from energy producers to consumers in the history of the United States. So we have to figure out how to make those hundreds of millions of decisions redound to the default choice of an efficient electric machine. And that's also important for another reason, because um, as long as we have machines that have pipes that plug into, that connect to the pipes sticking out of our walls, um, it's very hard for the strategies about decarbonizing our supply to work. Because in order to do that, we need machines that have plugs that connect to outlets in our walls. 
Um, so that's what we're focused on at rewiring. Um, and I want to connect it to equity, of course, um, which is, um, I think, one of the most important um, attributes of how we address the climate crisis, because in the end, the planet does not care what the wealth uh, uh, status is of, someone's, of someone who has uh, an efficient electric machine. Um, it's just counting the emissions coming off of what we have in our homes. So there's no trickle-down strategy to climate that's going to work here. We have to have uh, a for-everyone strategy at the same time. And, um, and that means that what we need to do is really systematically get the friction out of the process for people um, because this is complicated for people. This is not stuff that they think about every day. Um, we need to be focused on aggregating demand in local markets because the more households that are raising their hands saying they want to move forward, the more efficient it is for people that are doing that work to, um, to believe that this is a, a good trade to know how to do and, um, and it's possible to do it over and over again. And then we need to be really committed to pull the resources together so that those that don't have a bunch of discretionary income to come out of pocket um, can be on that journey too. Um, and the good news is that there is enough resource altogether to make all of that happen. It just needs to be pulled together, which is an act of intention and commitment. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Ari. Um, so everyone in this room by now knows that about two years ago, Congress passed a bill called the Inflation Reduction Act, and includes a whole lot of tax credits um, and other funding to electrify and decarbonize the economy. And so if you think about the government as a person, it, the brain of the government, um, especially on the IRA implementation, uh, is the office where Christina works. Uh, and I would suspect, Christina, that you are like whatever the central part of the brain that does all of the hard work and thinking. So tell us what you do in the White House. Thanks, Greg. It's, a, it's actually the part that responds to fear. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, so much, uh, Greg, for putting this amazing panel together in the Aspen Institute and B uh, for, for doing all the behind the scenes work. Uh, I'm Christina Costa. I'm the deputy assistant to the president for clean energy innovation and implementation. What does that mean? Uh, so only 18 months ago, Greg, don't age us up, uh, co uh, Congress passed uh, after a lot of wrangling and the president signed into law the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which is the largest investment in US history, probably in, in global history, uh, to accelerate building a clean energy economy. It is a really an all of government approach uh, there are programs in the Inflation Reduction Act to decarbonize heavy industry, to decarbonize transportation, uh, to promote climate smart agriculture, um, uh, to accelerate manufacturing of clean energy technologies in the United States, uh, and to uh, decarbonize and electrify homes and buildings. Uh, the law can kind of be thought of as being split into two big chunks uh, when it comes to the climate and clean energy provisions. Uh, we have about $120 billion in grant and loan programs uh, authorized by the Inflation Reduction Act. And those are spread across the federal agencies um, to, to do what is, you know, kind of the, the typical work of the federal government, uh, to set up programs, to offer funding, uh, whether it's to states or localities or nonprofit organizations or, or private sector enterprises, uh, to do good things, to install pollution control technologies, to install um, electric appliances or upgrade, uh, uh, and to, to, to make energy efficiency improvements in homes. Um, in the last 18 months, uh, we have launched uh, nearly 90% of the grants and loan programs in the Inflation Reduction Act. That means they have made at least one uh, funding round available to applicants, uh, and we are on track to obligate uh, at least 80% of that funding by the end of 2024, um, because the most important thing is to get that money out into communities, 
uh, to start providing benefits. A couple of the really important things for purposes of this conversation in that part of the law uh, are at the Environmental Protection Agency. We have our own greenhouse gas reduction fund. Thank you very much. Um, it is very different than CARBs. Uh, but that is a $27 billion first-of-its-kind program uh, to do three things. One, to help capitalize national nonprofit green lending institutions uh, that will work to pilot new uh, forms of financing and project development uh, focused on uh, electrifying equitably, on, on, on clean transportation, um, uh, and on um, projects principally that benefit low-income communities uh, to help all people, as we've been talking about, uh, benefit from the clean energy economy. So that's competition one. Competition two is doing the same thing, but with community lending institutions, CDFIs, credit unions, small community lenders that really work deep in the communities that they serve uh, and can help pull all of the, the folks together uh, who are going to be important for making sure that these projects uh, benefit the people that they are intended to benefit. And then competition three is called Solar for All. Uh, and uh, that will give $7 billion uh, principally to states and, and, and other uh, public institutions to help install residential, principally residential and community rooftop sol residential rooftop solar and community solar projects, again, uh, aimed at benefiting low-income communities. This is going to be, this is not like a one and done thing with the Inflation Reduction Act. The entire notion behind the GGRF um, is to catalyze additional ongoing financing so that even though the money will go out the door from the federal government this year, the benefits will have a very long tail for many, many years to come as we build an entirely new ecosystem uh, of, of financing models and of lenders uh, and of, of project developers. So that's, that's just one piece of this law, guys. Um, one other piece that I would highlight on the, on the grant side uh, that gets less attention than the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund but speaks to how central equitable electrification is to the IRA and to how we're implementing it uh, is a program at the Department of the Interior uh, to electrify tribal homes that amazingly in this day and age, in 2024, do not have electricity. There are a uh, few 10,000, um, it's, it's hard to get an exact figure, um, tribal homes, principally in the American Southwest, some in other parts of the country that do not have electricity in their homes. DOI just made the first round of announcements of, of awards for that program about a week ago. There's a second round open now um, uh, to, to help use the new technologies that are more available to use rooftop and community solar, to use energy storage, uh, to improve energy efficiency uh, so that every home in America, uh, no matter how rural, no matter how remote, no matter how low income, uh, can have electricity, lights, heating, cooling, refrigeration. Uh, so that is a, a huge opportunity and something that, that our team is really proud of and the Department of Interior team is really proud to, to be advancing. The lion's share of the Inflation Reduction Act is, on, is, is flowing through the tax code, however. Um, that is where the majority of the announcements that you may see uh, in the news or from us are, are being spurred. Uh, and what is happening on the tax side is that the IRA contains about two dozen newer expanded tax provisions um, for both businesses and consumers and actually for uh, new programs that benefit nonprofit um, and tax exempt entities as well for the first time ever through the tax code. Uh, these do principally uh, three things. They incentivize businesses to invest, again, in manufacturing of clean energy technologies uh, or in production of, uh, of, of clean electrons or, or other forms of clean energy. Uh, they provide incentives directly to consumers to purchase electric appliances, to make energy efficiency improvements, or to purchase uh, new or used, for the first time ever, electric vehicles. 
Uh, and then there's this weird thing called direct pay, which I'm very excited about. Uh, and similar to the, G the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, uh, is going to catalyze entirely new ways of actually making clean energy investment work in the United States. Uh, and so, very briefly, uh, direct pay uh, is a brand new provision that for the first time ever enables states, cities, tribes, territories, nonprofit organizations, churches, school districts, public hospitals and universities uh, to get a payment from the IRS that is equivalent to the tax credit that a business would receive uh, for participating in a quali for, for, for putting a qualifying clean energy project into service. Um, so for the, yes, enthusiasm for direct pay, we love it. Um, this is a huge opportunity um, for a number of reasons, but one of the biggest is because it is not capped and it is not competitive. Um, so all of these kinds of institutions that are really used to coming to the government for limited amounts of grant funding, putting these huge complicated applications together, not knowing whether the money is going to flow at the end of the day, just kind of crossing fingers and wishing and hoping and all of us who either are in government or have worked in government never having enough money <laughs> to, to fund all of the projects that deserve to be funded, that can go out the window. And uh, these institutions can work uh, with the kinds of uh, the kinds of non the, the kinds of financial institutions being funded through the GTRF. Uh, they can work with their community lenders. They can work with foundations uh, to help. Uh, they they can work with service providers like like Carla's uh, company to plan and build and put in service projects and know that at the end they will get a predictable amount of money back from the IRS for doing so. And so not unlike the GGRF, this is gonna open up entirely new ecosystems of how we plan and build and fund projects. And it is going to enable communities, particularly low-income communities, to actually literally own the power that they use. And so my job, to wrap up, is to get all of these things up and operational and off the ground, to work with folks like everyone here on the stage with me and, and folks like all of you here in the room, not only to, to spread the word about what the programs and opportunities are and how they work and the nuts and bolts of it, um, but to help stand up these I keep using the word ecosystem, but really these ecosystems of partners, because at the end of the day, we can set the rules of the road, we can make the funding available, we can you know, prioritize uh, equity in the program design, um, but we, the federal government, are not where the rubber hits the road and actually delivering the services and delivering the goods. Uh, it's, it's all of you, and, and, and so that is uh, how I fit into this wonderful world. Excellent, thank you, Christina. Um, so speaking of where the rubber meets the road, Carla, can you talk a little bit about some of the conversations that you have with homeowners, with renters, with um, you know people who are look who who either have a have come to you thinking about electrifying their homes or getting an EV or an EV charger, and maybe they're hesitant. You're in Michigan, and it gets a little cold there sometimes, and so you know thinking about switching to a heat pump instead of a gas furnace or something like what are those conversations how do those conversations go and how um, are you able to uh, you know talk to them about the benefits here yeah for our affluent families and business owners it's it's a much easier to talk to them because they really are most interested in the technology number one and in whether there are financing mechanisms um, Every now and then, we get um, comments about the technology. Uh, one of the things that uh, is a barrier to a lot of what we're talking about is the uh, dearth of contractors who are familiar with the technologies. In Michigan and Illinois, many contractors still say that heat pumps don't work in northern climates. So if I have had the same boiler guy you know, for 30 years, and I go to him, which this is I actually did, and said, hey, I want to do heat pumps. Oh, no, no, no. And this is someone I trust. I've grown to know and trust over decades. No, you don't want a heat pump. You need to wait at least five years 
before you put a heat pump in your home. No quote, no nothing. Go to the second guy, and these are the conversations. Uh, it's going to cost you $150,000 without even measuring my house, doing load uh, calculations or anything. So the, the fact that contractors who aren't familiar, who don't feel safe, who are contractors sell what they have, okay? So that is how they make their money, selling what they have, know and understand. So that is one of the conversations I have with homeowners all the time is I haven't uh, found anyone who will actually do that. So one of the things that this money is facilitating and the utilities are facilitating is contractor training. Now, one of the things about contractor training and, and workforce development training for that matter is that it needs to be paid because if a contractor is supposed to sit in a room for two weeks and he's a small independent contractor, that's two weeks that he's not making money. So one of the things that equity needs to drive is compensation for what we're trying to get people to do because they are making trade-offs. They are making decisions that are going to disrupt their very their home economies and their business economies. So uh, if we really are, are serious about expediting the pace of change, then we need to find ways to make it less painful to the people that we're depending on. Uh, the other thing that I find is people are so enamored with uh, some technologies, for instance, solar, that they minimize very simple things like energy efficiency. We get calls all the time for people who want rooftop solar, but they have not done the minor things. They haven't done the air sealing, the insulation, the changing LED light bulbs, the appliance. They haven't done any of those things, and they want to do solar. For me to protect them, I need to say the first thing you need to do is shrink the load on your home so that when you do a solar installation, you're doing a smaller, less expensive solar installation. So the, um, the education has to be a large part of all of the practitioners um, in, this, in this ecosystem because we are trying to create an ecosystem as opposed to a zillion disparate attempts and opinions and efforts so that we do expedite this. I think that's a really good point. And I, you know, I think one of the biggest selling points for the clean energy transition is, are, are all of these new jobs, um, and especially in places like install, installing uh, heat pumps and doing energy efficiency. And um, I think the one thing we don't, we don't do, Aspen doesn't do well enough, and I'll channel my inner Amory Levins, is talk about energy efficiency and conservation and the best uh, kilowatt hour is a kilowatt hour not not uh, not spent. So when you don't use, absolutely. Um, so going from uh, you know people's basements and laundry rooms where their heat pumps are to kind of some of the biggest equipment in the world, Steve, in your state, you've got several of the busiest ports in the world, um, and. The, historically, ports have been run off fossil fuels and have put out a ton of particulate matter that uh, people breathe in. And so how are you thinking about decarbonizing ports, electrifying ports, um, and, and that from the CARB perspective? Yeah, thanks, Greg. So uh, we do have some of the largest ports in the nation, and uh, much of the nation's freight actually comes through those ports. So the impact to communities near the ports um, for the th packages that you might all get in, in your homes, uh, even out here in Miami, um, sometimes is coming from clear across the United States and coming through that port complex in, in Los Angeles. And so one of, the, one of the big things that we've tried to do is uh, to reduce the amount of emissions coming from the various pieces of equipment that are at ports. So that includes the ships that are coming in, that includes the cargo handling equipment at the ports themselves, and the, the transportation of that freight from the port to some intermodal comp complex or um, from the port across the United States. So tackling all of those three issues or three um, pieces of equipment or types of equipment is really complex. One of the so one of the primary ways that we've done this is pair incentives with regulatory action. So we have a regulation 
for ships that are at berth. We now have over 500 ships in California that come into ports in California that are able to plug in. That's 33 different fleets that are um, have vessels that are um, able to plug in, and we have the um, port side uh, equipment for those ships to plug in when they get into port. The, the big advantage there is while they're sitting at port, they're not burning this uh, dirty fuel that would otherwise pollute those neighborhoods. And this has been a really successful program. Uh, like I say, there's 500 ships that are now ready to receive that power. So that's one aspect. Uh, we've also done a lot of work in uh, making zero emission equipment available to ports. Um, so there's everything from top picks to um, other kinds of cargo handling equipment that are zero emissions that we've helped incentivize. And we're promulgating regulations to ultimately require that equipment to get cleaner over time as well. And then on the uh, drayage side, so those are trucks that enter the port, that go from the port to a warehouse, and we have a huge number of warehouses in the Inland Empire and in the Central Valley of California that uh, receive goods that come from the port. So these are trucks that drive to and from those warehouses. Their round trips are well within the capability of current technology that is zero emissions, so current battery or hydrogen fuel cell technology. And so we've now uh, established a regulation which will require all of those drayage vehicles to be zero emissions by 2035. Not new purchases, all of those trucks will have to be zero emissions by 2035. So that's one of the ways that we're getting at that kind of zero emissions um, uh, goal in these, in these poor complexes. And a lot of people have focused on this transition from truck to train because that's more greenhouse gas efficient. The problem is locomotives in this nation are old and they're dirty. So in fact, because we've regulated the emissions out of most of the trucks, it turns out the trucks are much cleaner. Greenhouse gas, yes, it's more efficient per pound of cargo. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can move it on a train much more carbon efficiently, but we're not getting at that toxic air pollution and that criteria air pollution that we need to get at. So more needs to be done on that side. We actually do have a regulation for cleaner locomotives in use. Um, and um, our understanding is that EPA is looking at this issue as well. So we're excited about all of the efforts there. We have a few zero emission locomotives in operation in California. I think there's about uh, 12 total that are being tested in various applications, um, and that will increase over time. But especially for that intermodal type work where you're, you're, you would electrify, say, a corridor um, that only has to go 20 or 40 miles, zero emissions could be well within the capability of current technology um, for those applications as well. So it's, it, is, it is up and coming, um, but again, as with all of this, uh, a lot of work to do. We're really excited about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, there's a ton of opportunity to get those tax credits for clean equipment. So we're out there proselytizing as well. Hey, the, there's these tax credits. We want to tell people about it. We want to pair or stack our incentives with theirs and use that information to help drive more aggressive regulations. If the money is there to help buy down the cost, that makes our regulations more cost effective and allows us to push harder and faster. And every ship that is plugged in and not burning uh, oil is that's that's fewer emissions that kids are breathing in and um, and, and it impacts health. Um, Ari, let's talk about software. How are you thinking about um, providing, I guess, resources, education, opportunities for people to learn about electrification um, through uh, the internet, through software, and how is that, um, I guess, how is that going? And like, are there things that you or others can do more or better that um, can help get this word out to more people? Um, sure. Um, so people every single day in this country are making a decision about something that is broken or breaking 
or that they're looking at and saying, I want to change this out in my home. And if you kind of think about it from a climate strategy perspective, if we're all um, putting on our running shoes and chasing a van down the street to say, wait, 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 think about a heat pump, uh, it's probably not the right point of intervention. And to Carla's point, there is this um, really mismatched dynamic where the individual who is buying the thing is really not the most informed person about the thing that they're buying. So they rely very, very much on the professional who they have been referred to, who they've known forever. Um, but 85% of contractors in the United States earn less than a million dollars a year in revenue. And if you say to them, there's this awesome thing that you should totally do and sell in your community, call the heat pump or an induction stove or whatever the case might be. And they say, that's great. How many of those am I going to sell this year? And you say, it's going to be great. Uh, <laughs> they're probably not going to change their business model because that's not a compelling reason. So the way that we think about that then, I mentioned earlier, aggregating demand, you know, there, one way to get people to learn about these new technologies and be supportive about installing them and trained about how to do so is if a lot of potential customers are calling them and saying, you know what I would like to do? I'd like to install A, B, and C. Um, and so for us, the way we have thought about this is to create and build software products that help households go on that journey. Um, so we started off 18 short months ago uh, when the president signed the Inflation Reduction Act into law, and we put out a calculator to help you understand what you would be eligible for in, uh, through that uh, historic law. Um, and we've spent no money marketing uh, the, this calculator, and close to 800,000 households have used it over the past 18 months. Because it turns out that people want to know how much money they can get. That's like a pretty common thing. Um, and so we've built on top of that, uh, we've built alongside that a couple of pieces, and they are all designed to go together and start to help households go on this journey. First, we've built a machine learning model to help calculate the energy savings potential uh, in a household of any specific measure that someone takes on and what the emissions reduction would be from that uh, transition. Um, that helps us then uh, build what we call our personal electrification planning tool, which helps a household figure out what they can do to their home and what they might expect the energy bill savings and emissions reductions to be as a result. It is tied to that calculator I mentioned, which is now going to pull in um, state, local, and utility incentives and rebates as well. Um, so that you in one place can figure out what you might want to do um, how much you're eligible for on a blended basis, and so therefore how much you might expect to pay. Um, and, the, and as we build this out, connecting you to contractors to go and do that work. So that helps us to create a, a, a bunch of information for households to understand and be empowered. Um, and then working with partners from mayors to corporates to nonprofits, to take all of that content and push it out through their networks and their communities um, so that there is a common place for people to go to find out what they might want to do. And they're hearing it from people in their community that they actually trust, like a mayor um, who says, hey, here's some information for you. Um, and that helps to make it become um, a, sort of like a public utility of information, as it were. Uh, where people can find out what they what makes sense for them. Um, that's all really important, but if we expect people to sort of like um, all find that and do it themselves and navigate all of that, um, that's a high bar, right? So uh, the way that we think about this is that it starts to become, it's a continuum of sorts. You get people to get their plans about what they might do in their home, and they take that first step. Once someone starts on that electrification journey, the everything that they do after is easier to do. Because basically what's happening is they're changing out the operating system in their home 
from being a fossil fuel one to being an efficient electric one. Um, and so it's really about getting someone started on that pathway. Um, but then the other piece is connecting community, um, uh, basically people in communities like Carla and her team uh, who can act as coaches and uh, supports to help people sort of have uh, confidence and be empowered in what they might do, but also kind of be walked along in the process so they're, they're not alone. And so it's not, you know, software, our belief, is incredibly important uh, as a step uh, and an enabling mechanism for causing this transition to happen more quickly and at scale. Um, but we don't believe that that is the sort of sufficient condition. Uh, you need to build the community ecosystem around those tools in order to get the demand uh, sort of identified and then to action to take place on the other side. Excellent, thank you. And I will put a plug in that I used your calculator last year when I was looking at solar panels and I got my tax uh, refund, um, my tax credit, my solar panels this week. Um, Christina, so there you, you, you talked about a little bit this um, before. Can you connect some of the dots about how you're thinking about equity in the IRA and electrification, Justice 40, um, and then also kind of how you're getting this information to local governments, to uh, stakeholders, um, and some of those conversations that you're having on getting the word out on, on some of these, especially the tax credits and the grants. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, at the very beginning of, of implementing the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we uh, worked with all of the agencies uh, that have the, the grant and loan programs that I was discussing earlier uh, to identify which ones uh, they would consider to be uh, Justice 40 covered programs. Justice 40 is an initiative uh, from the president uh, that is aiming to ensure that at least 40% uh, of the benefits of federal investment uh, go to uh, low income and disadvantaged communities uh, that can benefit the most uh, from those investments, uh, places that have been historically overburdened by pollution, uh, places uh, that uh, have been historically disinvested in. Um, there is a map, uh, and the lists are all public, uh, uh, so encourage folks to go and look at what uh, are considered uh, Justice 40 uh, communities and, and which programs in particular uh, are, are aimed uh, at uh, prioritizing uh, delivering benefits to those communities. Um, but that is, uh, you know, again, sort of an all-of-government effort, uh, and uh, not just within the Inflation Reduction Act or the, or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, it also covers base appropriations, other uh, agency actions and activities. Uh, it has been uh, really a sea change uh, in the way the federal government thinks about uh, approaching its investments. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of lessons learned in the last three years, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of progress made, but a long way to go as well. Uh, on the tax side, um, we have less ability uh, under normal circumstances as the federal government to direct where tax credits go uh, because it is dependent on the decisions of businesses, uh, on the decisions of individual households, whether they are going to uh, make a purchase or make an investment that qualifies uh, for a tax credit. Uh, but there are some hooks in the law that are really innovative and interesting to help try to incentivize more of that investment to go to uh, the places and the people who can benefit the most. Uh, so for the first time ever uh, on those big business tax credits I was discussing, uh, you can get a 10% bonus uh, if your investment is located in an energy community, um, which is a community uh, where either a coal-fired power plant has closed, a coal mine has closed, uh, any brownfield investment uh, qualifies as being an energy community, um, and there's a very complicated calculation about uh, fossil fuel employment rates that I'm not going to get into, um, although sadly I could. Um, uh, uh, there's a map on energycommunities.gov of what the energy communities are uh, for purposes of this bonus tax credit, uh, but basically this means instead of getting a 30% tax credit uh, for a company making an investment, or instead of getting 30% of the cost of your investment back, if you are one of those direct pay eligible entities I was talking about earlier, if you do the investment in one of these energy communities, you can get 40%. 
Uh, and that is a pretty good chunk of change uh, on top of the base credits. Um, there are new requirements uh, in the IRA to get to that 30% uh, for uh, paying prevailing wages to workers uh, and utilizing registered apprentices uh, on clean energy projects. Uh, and this is a, a part of trying to uh, ensure that jobs in the clean energy industry are good paying jobs, are family sustaining jobs, are jobs that are uh, benefiting communities over the long term. Um, that is a that is brand new in the Inflation Reduction Act, never been done before. Um, uh, there is also a, a bonus credit for utilizing domestic content in projects. Uh, so again, attempting to uh, provide incentives uh, for using uh, products made in the United States, uh, some of which are incentivized elsewhere in the tax code uh, to, to be produced in the first place. Um, and finally, uh, there is, a, for the first time ever, uh, a bonus of 10 to 20 percent uh, for small projects under five megawatts placed in service uh, in low-income communities, uh, tribal lands, um, on qualified uh, low-income housing, federal low-income housing projects, uh, or that provide economic benefits to low-income households. Um, we affectionately call it 48 little e. Um, uh, but that uh, program, uh, again, first of its kind, uh, the first round of that program ran last year. Uh, and for uh, we received more than 40,000 applications. Uh, for allocations in that program. Uh, and again, that is something that is going to run over the long term. And so, you know, we are internally working as the federal government uh, to prioritize uh, equity uh, through, ju through Justice 40 in, in implementing the grant and loan programs. And then we have these new tools and incentives on the tax side uh, to try to drive more of the investment uh, that we don't control as, as directly to the people in the places that need it most. Um, finally, I will just say that we spend a lot of time uh, doing outreach uh, and engagement uh, with our governors, with our mayors, um, with nonprofit organizations, with foundations, um, uh, to, to try to both make sure folks know where we are in implementation. I keep saying these things are new, like literally we are standing them up in real time. Um, and so things change, they move, they become available, the, the program rules get clarified. Uh, and so we're just trying to keep that information flowing out to folks, but we also need to get information in from all of these uh, from all of these uh, partners and stakeholders uh, who are going uh, into into people's homes and having these conversations, uh, or who are um, helping uh, actual people and small businesses and communities figure out how to stack and layer and and braid together all of these things that I'm talking about, so that we can know what else we can do from, from the federal government side to make it easier uh, to comply, to make it easier to access these resources um, and, and to um, make the program work. Uh, because at the end of the day, as I, as I said at the beginning, um, we, can, we can make it available, but the real implementation uh, happens uh, many steps removed from, from my office. So we have a couple minutes left and I wanna go to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, so I've got one back here. Please introduce yourself and direct your question at one of our panelists. Oh, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Noel Weber with the City of Miami Beach. Um, so we talked a lot about kind of energy assistance or kind of ways to weatherize homes. Um, but in reality, a lot of these kind of energy assistance and weatherization programs have kind of failed to reach renters, um, particularly because the um, owners and um, of these uh, multifamily complexes for renters don't have to pay their own rent or they don't have to pay their own energy bills. Um, those get passed down to the renters. So uh, what is being done to kind of reach those multifamily owners in order to conduct these programs because the tax incentive doesn't really give them that kind of incentive to do that since they already don't pay those energy bills. Who wants to take, start with? Um, I, I can take that. In, um, in Detroit and in Chicago, actually cities are tackling this. A lot of cities are writing into their policies that if uh, multifamily apartment owners take advantage of certain incentives, 
Number one, they can't raise the rent because one of the things that's happened is multifamily owners have done the upgrades to raise the rent and displaced people who have been in those uh, positions for a long time. But in Detroit, the other thing that's happening is that there is a growth in just the tenants' rights movement. And if you're interested in it, if you just Google tenants' rights all across the country, tenants are really realizing that they do have rights and they can actually take these solutions to their landlords and help their landlords understand. On a lot of the main up, major upgrades we've done, it was not the landlord. We had trouble even finding the landlord in many cases, but the tenants were able to get their attention and number one and number two, even withhold money as their energy bills and energy burdens began to climb, climb to help them uh, understand how important this is. Uh, right up front here. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah, and I'm an urban planner in California. Um, my question is in regards to um, low-income homes. Some of them aren't the most safe, and they have lead or asbestos in them, and it impacts the process of decarbonizing homes when you're not really addressing the first basic needs for safe and sanitary homes. I guess um, either for Carla or Ari, like what is, is there a check in your process to be sure that those homes, those basic um, needs are addressed before making that next step into decarbonizing the home? Um, again, so much of this is up to the cities. Um, there is money in the IRA for asbestos remediation. Uh, so in Detroit, there's a 75% walk away rate. And what that means is that even if you are entitled to free, a free furnace, a free stove, a free home evaluation, if you haven't taken care of mold, asbestos, and lead, we can't do the upgrades. So what we do is we refer people to another, to the city, and to other entities that have money and can remediate lead and mold and other things. And more money is being put into that ecosystem so we can address the issues. And that even includes, some people have holes in their roofs. They have things that would negate adding more energy efficiency things. So that is being addressed. But again, that's why policy is so important and that's why the voices of, of people, just plain old people are so important. Can I just say one quick thing about that? I think this is also why it's so critical to combine the idea of housing, habitability, safety, standards with climate and energy. Um, and one of the things that makes me really excited about the generational impact of the Inflation Reduction Act is that it is pushing an enormous amount of resource ultimately into our housing stock. And as um, as was mentioned, most of this money is actually going to housing, in fact, because of all of the tax credits. It's very consumer focused, um, which means there is a huge incentive for property owners to get the benefit of the upgrade. Whereas if you look at some of these other um, housing uh, focused programs that deal with these sorts of issues, they've been chronically underfunded um, and they've been capped and they have um, uh, sort of been uh, politically left behind oftentimes and tragically in communities. Now, if we are really focused on aggregating demand of homeowners and households that would be beneficiaries of these climate and energy focused upgrades and then are coming into contact with remediation requirements and safety upgrades, there is a different conversation to have about how we get the resources in for those households so that they can be on that pathway. So I, I actually am very optimistic that if we design this well and do this well, we will uh, move the needle on some of these core um, housing rights issues um, that have been chronically underinvested in because of the dollars that are coming in to focus on climate and energy. So I want. Uh, so we're out of time. I've always said that we uh, could do this event for 80 straight days and we wouldn't run out of conversation. Um, two quick things before we wrap up. There's going to be a code.
on the screen where you can fill out a survey. We would love to hear your feedback about this session. Second thing is be sure to join us at 3 o'clock at the plenary downstairs for the closing. Um, and I want to thank all of our panelists for today. Thank you.